It gives me great pleasure to host another lunch and learn session put on by the Office of Utilities Regulation. I am Elizabeth Bennett Marsh, the Public Education Specialist at the Office of Utilities Regulations. I won't do the official welcome, but I still say welcome. I recently look up, or looked up what are some of the great qualities of a lunch and learn session to see if we met the criteria, and this is what I found. It must have a great list of invitees representing our target groups. I think we have that, right? Amen. Thank you. It must have an educational content. Check. Killer venue and delicious food. I think the venue is spacious, and I can assure you the food is good. So yes and yes. And professional logistics, definitely. So given the foregoing, I think the stage is set for a great session today. Don't you agree? Yeah. Great. Our guest speaker today is the Director of Regulation, Policy, Monitoring and Enforcement, Cedric Wilson. And after his presentation, we invite your questions and then we'll break bread together. In addition to you here today, we're also streaming live on the OUR's Twitter page, the OURJA, through Periscope. So we text, we match to text your friends and tell them to log on and see you. So that's the OURJA, we're streaming live on Twitter via Periscope. I now invite the coordinator for the OUR's information centers, Kishana Mongo, to do the official welcome and introduction of our guest speaker. Kishana? Good afternoon. Thank you for participating in this, the OUR Information Center's fifth quarterly lunch and learn session. A warm welcome to you all who left your offices to join us for lunch and to learn together. A special welcome to those who are joining us via Periscope on our Twitter page, the OUR JA. I hope at the end of today's session, you will find it was worth your time. The OUR's lunch and learn sessions are designed as another way of communicating with you, consumers, about important issues of which you should be aware. It is an opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with you and connect. Recently, the OUR reviewed JPS's application for an extraordinary wage review, a provision made possible under the JPS Electricity License 2016. Today, I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker, Mr. Cedric Wilson, who will be presenting on the topic, the implications of the OUR's decision on JPS's application for extraordinary wage review. Mr. Wilson is the Director of Regulation, Policy, Monitoring and Enforcement at the Office of Utilities Regulation. He received training in electric, electrical engineering at the University of Technology and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Economics and Management as well as a Master's of Science degree in Economics from the University of the West Indies. He has 25 years experience working in the electric utility industry and has done extensive work in electricity tariff development regulatory policies, and strategic planning. Mr. Wilson has had the opportunity to work in several countries across the Caribbean, including serving as a project manager for the CARICOM Renewable Energy Study in 2015 and tariff consultant to the Eastern Caribbean Electricity Commission in 2016. He has written numerous articles for the Jamaica Gleaner, and has published in the Journal of Management Policy and Practice on Strategic Management. Currently, Mr. Wil Mr. Wilson lectures Economics at the Mona School of Business and Management at the UWI in the MBA program. All join me in extending a hearty welcome to Mr. Cedric Wilson. Thank you very much, Kishan. When I heard that, I was looking around 
the introduction I was looking around to see who that <laughs> But um, it's good to see so many of you. Um, I know that some speakers um, will speak in direct proportion to the number of people um, who are present. Um, and I know I have that inclination. <laughs> But uh, let's get to the subject matter. We want to talk about the extraordinary rate review and the implications. In October last year, we got the OUR that is, we got a submission from JPS for an extraordinary rate review. And JPS claimed that the new depreciation schedule, which is a part of the new license that they got, accounted for the changes that they had applied to their accounts. And it resulted in the impairment, um, asset impairment, and uh, their 2016 um, accounts, and also they expected to see increases in their depreciation expense for 2017 and 2018. Uh, plus, plus other increases in depreciation for 2019 and beyond, and you will see the amount. Um, then 2016, the asset impairment was 13.4 billion US dollars. Um, for 2017 and 2018, it averaged about 3.9 billion US dollars. And between 2019 and 2018, the expected increase in depreciation cumulatively would be put at approximately $7.3 million. So that was the extent of the impairment and the increase in depreciation that JPS expected. The question is, was that submission warranted? Very important question. And yes, when we look back, they got a new license in January 2016, and there were changes in that license. First, the license moved the entire tariff regime from a price cap regime to a revenue cap regime. Second, there is a schedule, um, schedule four to be precise in the license, which says the depreciate, which speaks to the depreciable life of the assets by category, and there are changes. In fact, there are six categories, um, if you notice. Yeah. Six categories um, in which changes that occur. Pools, for example, in 20, uh, the 2011 license, the life, the expected life was 30 years. Now just changed to 20. Um, the test equipment and meters, it just changed from 25 to 50, and so on and so forth. All of these are star here. Um, I've seen changes. And of course, in all of the cases, these lives are short. So what this means is that the lives are shorter you are going to increase your depreciation expense because you are collecting for the entire investment over a shorter period of time. And that is exactly what happened. And in this regard, JPS argued that um, they need to be compensated for those uh, changes and the loss they would have experienced if they were just allowed, uh, allowed to leave it on the books as is. And the third change was that an extraordinary rate review mechanism was inserted 
in the new life. Before we only add um, a Z factor, perhaps I should explain what the extraordinary way to view mechanism is all about. You normally have um, a five year period in which you have a tariff review. So every five years you have a tariff review. Between that, during the 2011 license, for the 2011 license, what was allowed was a Z factor change, which means that if something extraordinary um, happens, which is not caused by management and is not included in the tariff, among other things, you could allow for an increase in the tariff. We experienced that once in 2004 when we had Hurricane Ivan, and as a result of that, a Z factor increase was passed down to customers. But there were no other uh, mechanisms apart from that. So, an extraordinary rate review mechanism was placed in the license in um, January, and it became effective then. And what that extraordinary rate review mechanism allowed, um, it allows for um, an actual rate review between that five years, and it should be permitted if you have uh, exceptional circumstances, to if the impact is significant, and when we talk about significant, we're talking about the cost, and three, um, the factors that caused it to happen were not considered or not known at the time of the last rate review. So those are the circumstances that can trigger an extraordinary rate review. And when we look at it, when the lawyers look at it, they concluded that based on what happened, JPS um, rate submission was warranted and we proceeded to review this rate submission. We came to a conclusion that the 2016 impairment of 13.4 million US dollars should be treated differently from the expected increase in depreciation expense for 2017 and for 2018 and for 2019 and beyond. So what we concluded is that the Z factor, which is backward looking, if you look at things that happened in the past, a Z factor adjustment should be applied to. But anything going forward, because of the structure and the nature of the new revenue cap regime, anything going forward ought to be correctly dealt with by a revision in the rate. So the idea was for the changes and the increases in depreciation, we would put it in the rate going forward. And for what happened in the past, we would seek to pass it through to customers by way of um, a Z factor arrangement. And anything beyond 2019, the time at which the next rate review is due, it will be dealt with at those specific rate reviews. So, beyond the numbers, though, we look deeper into the depreciation schedule, and we've got some experts aboard to help us to assess it. And we came to the conclusion that some of these depreciation rates in that schedule are questionable. And JPS themselves question the numbers in that schedule. For example, when you consider um, electricity poles, electricity poles, the new life in the 2016 schedule is 20 years. And JPS actually conceded that, listen to me, we have poles out there that last a much longer time. And they actually applied a 30-year depreciation rate um, to these poles rather than the 20 years 
specified in the lives. So as regulators, we were convinced that a comprehensive review ought to be done of the depreciation <coughs> schedule. And this is scheduled for some time before the 2019 rate review. Now, we conceded, we agreed that the adjustments must be done for the 2016 impairment. And when we worked it out, the 13.4 million plus um, opportunity cost um, associated with those expenses, if it is paid out over a one-year period, it will result in customers paying 15.1 million US dollars over a one-year period. If it is done over a two-year period, it will work out to um, an average of about 8 million annually. Marginally, what would that translate to for customers? Um, it will translate to approximately a 2% increase um, in tariff for one year past two of the full amount. Or if it translates to about 1.2% marginally, a marginal increase if it is done on a one year basis. Right? Now, when we look at the when we look at the extraordinary rate review, which would deal with the depreciation element, the forward-looking element, we came to several conclusions. One, it ought to be forward-looking, and two, it ought to be incremental. When we say incremental, what we mean is that the only thing that should be considered, the only thing that should be considered is the factors in the revenue requirement that were impacted by this adjustment in the depreciation schedule. That is what we actually do. And as a result of that, when we did our assessment, what it would mean is that one, there would be an increase in depreciation expenses going forward, but also, if you have changed your rate of depreciation, changed the rate at which you collect, um, recover for your assets or write off your assets, what it means is that your asset base is going to be smaller because you are reducing your asset base at a faster rate. So what we thought was necessary is to review the asset base of JPS. And when you know that you work out your returns on your investment, on your asset base. So when you do that calculation, what it means is that JPS return should go down. Um, and when we look at it, um, the preliminary look we have had on it is that when you net off, what happens to its return going down and its depreciation going up, the effect is supposed to be close to zero, if not a little bit negative. And what we have agreed to do is, because it is forward-looking, we have to look at GPS's investment plan in 2017 and in 2018. So what we have asked GPS to do is to submit the details of that um, investment plan, very details, you need to say what purpose is, um, justify the cost, and we will have an opportunity to look at benchmarks to ensure that those costs that GPS intend to spend will be done prudently and it will be done efficiently. And so GPS is supposed to get back to us with those investments so that we can look at it and make a determination by July 1 this year. So the question therefore is what is the full implications of the rate revision? 
And when we talk about the full implications, what you have to remember is that every year at about June, July, there is a rate review, an annual rate review, and that annual rate review is to look at what happened in terms of inflation, JPS's deficiency, its revenue cap, and all of those things. And so, instead of doing adjustments on a piecemeal basis, we have decided that everything ought to be done in June. But what is interesting is that JPS now operates under a revenue cap. And what that revenue cap says is that JPS is allowed a predetermined amount of revenue in one year. Therefore, if sales are very positive and sales grow, what it means is that JPS revenue, actual revenue, would be greater than what the target is. And what it means is that the following year, JPS will have to give back the extra revenue to customers. And of course, the opposite what? exists. What? If, <coughs> if sales is sluggish and slow, and the target actually exceeds JPS's performance, what it means is that rate would go up the following year in order to ensure that JPS collect the revenue that it didn't get the previous year. Now, last year, some interesting things happened. Some interesting things happened. Sales grew by 3.7%. Two years before, for three consecutive years, it was negative. Sales was going down. But something miraculous happened. So what this means is that this year we'll be seeing some give back. And what is important is for us to net off all of these changes, the increases and the decreases um, against the expected revenue throughout, to use that word. And so, while it is early days yet, and you can never tell what might happen, there might be extraordinary circumstances, God forbid, um, there might be other things, but what we anticipate is that the overall impact as a result of these three elements. Um, the increase should be, <coughs> at worst, negligible or minimal. And so um, this, we think, is the result of this extraordinary rate review. And this is where I stop. And you begin. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sergeant. We always have the talent of breaking down complex matters um, so that people like me can understand it because I'm very non technical. I, I, did you benefit from that a while ago? Yes. I yes. hope it was very useful for you because we found it useful as well to have you come and talk with you. So we're going to open up the floor and I see I recognize someone at the front as well. And if you have any questions, just raise your hands and I'll just go around. Thank you, sir. That really was quite clear. Thank you. The only question that I have that's worth asking is um, about the impairment. In terms of the impairment that um, that um, folks, is it that all you are to relieve that, that level of impairment is acceptable or is it something that was, you know, that was not controversial at all? We agree that the impairment is real. We got um, Price Waterhouse Coopers um, as financial expert to look at the case's calculation. And they did agree that the calculation more or less is correct and we accepted that determination. Um, Further question? Yes, sir. Don't be afraid. I am just a man. Good afternoon, sir. 
Oh, yes. Yes, you want to say it then? Susan King. Yes. Do you anticipate any negativity with the U.S. government or U.S. President Donald Trump to the United States to be forced to be a negative state where our checks to be the rash based on this policy as opposed to um, in the garden, like renegotiating trade deals and whatever. I don't know if we have to get anything from that. Um, actually, I call myself a promise, but I have thought very seriously about the implication of Trump and fuel prices and prices in the U.S. But one thing I can say for sure when it comes to Trump, any number can be. <laughs> Taxes, so uh, that part is inescapable. 
as to how the government will deal with that debt portion, um, I do have a clue, but um, you know, <laughs> let's hope that the economy is picking up. You know. Yeah. Well. Um, that's part of the class for Buckley. We have another question over here. And uh, while I go to this lady, just remind you, on your desk, you have feedback forms. I think you all should have pens as well. Please use the time to just tell us how you... Etc. Yes, ma'am. Um, we have a next slide from Tasha. Please raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Just to say, um, that's why we are encouraged to pay our government tax. Because the public tax takes care of the lesser city on the road, the street lights, um, and all of that. So we are encouraged to pay. And in that, you know, the government will be able to pay for the bills that they are um, could, could I hear a little bit more about the smart street lights? I just want to hear a little bit more about it because I'm so interested in it. Well, um, we have some representatives here. Um, they will be able to talk in more specific terms. I don't know, Camille, if you would say a few words. I don't want to put them on the spot. Maybe in due course, they will roll out some information about it. Definitely. Um, we have actually started rolling out some of the information on the smart On the smart street that is a success. We have all the changes that are actually rolling out the so the smart street lighting system, as Cedric mentioned, will give us a lot more control on the street lighting system. So we'll be able to tell us, we say, whether the lights go, whether there's any tamper with the street light, and we'll be able to meter each street light individually. And of course, we'll be using LED, so there'll be the benefit of um, energy efficiency from the LED, the use of the LED will cut our fuel bill significantly. So that that benefit will accrue to the government and to the country. Um, in terms of the project itself, um, we're anticipating that the rollout of the project will start this year. And we're, decide, we're basically divided, up, divided into three phases. So in phase one, we'll do an, um, an installation of 35,000 streetlights. I think primarily we're targeting Kingston, St. Catherine, and probably to some extent Montego Bay. Then the next phase will take place in the following year, and so on until we're complete. So we're expected to to uh, replace the entire 110 street lights um, that we now have on the grid on our system. 110,000. Sorry, <laughs> it would be surprising if it was only 110. <laughs> All right, <laughs> and we're actually starting um, the New Kingston area. I don't know if you notice that New Kingston is much brighter. Much prettier, you can see yes. much better at night. Um, that's because we have actually started a project in New Kingston in terms of changing all the street lights. Uh, we're doing some other things um, under the Smart Grid project, which we have actually started. And we're expecting that all the issues that we have with street lights within the next three years, all of those will be eliminated. What's your name again? <laughs> no, <laughs> I am not the person. I'm not the corporate comparison, but I'm just informing you what is happening. Um, that was very good for this occasion. Did anybody not fill out the registration form? Is there anyone who did not fill out the registration form that we have? Any other question? Okay, so it now falls to our director for consumer and public affairs, Yvonne Nicholson, to render the vote of thanks before we have Yvonne. Every letter here, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear it so warm Mr. Cedric again? First of all, I'd love to thank the organizers. Liz and her team always do an incredible job. So please. <laughs> to the audience, you've taken your lunch time to come and sit with us, learn a little something, something, and enjoy some food with us. And we thank you for that because your time, I know, is very precious. So thank you so much. <laughs> Finally, the man of the moment, Mr. Cedric, thank you so much for 
the knowledge that you have so freely given us. And we know that we can always call on you anytime. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Right. On behalf of CPA, there's a little token. So again, thanks for coming and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And with that being said, lunch is now served, buffet style. So if you could um, join the line and help yourself to lunch. And sit with us, please, and eat and chat. We have a few. Oh, you are a person and not me, so talk with us. I'm uh, headed by our Deputy Director General, Houghton Hera. Mr. Hera, let the body see us wave your hand so that people can see you. So that's Mr. Hera right there beside it is Peter Johnson, who is manager for monitoring. And you know the rest of the team, and we have all along the wall at the back, all OUR you are first. No. There we are. I'm sure I found one of those there. So please talk with us, we always want to because we don't want to engage you. And launch, please, okay, staff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.